Very good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of Clinical Infectious Disease Society, CI SIDS, uh, we welcome you to the SIDS webinar series on COVID-19. Um, this is the fourth lecture on the diagnostic aspects, laboratory diagnostic aspects of uh, COVID-19. And um, a few housekeeping announcements to start with. Uh, the Zoom app access would be for the initial thousand attendees. People who join in late can always have access to this presentation live through the YouTube. And for that, you will have to type SIDS webinar in the YouTube. And the previous lectures are all available on our website, the Clinical Infectious Disease Society, CIDSindia.org, SIDSindia.org. And, um, and uh, the questions, uh, I would request the participants to ask questions relevant to this talk. This talk is going to be on the diagnostic aspects. Uh, please avoid asking questions in other aspects of COVID-19. And uh, please pertain the questions to the topic of discussion today. And uh, I would, uh, the speaker for the session is Dr. Rajiv Soman. And uh, he's one of those pioneers in the field of infectious disease in India and a uh, great stalwart, excellent teacher. And he has um, uh, shown the way for many young uh, trainees in the field of infectious diseases from the Western part of India. And uh, he would be the speaker. And the moderator for the session is Dr. Osi Abraham, the president of our society, the Clinical Infectious Disease Society. And he's a professor of medicine at uh, CMC Vellore. And uh, off to Dr. Osi Abraham to start the session with the introduction to the speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nambi. Uh, good afternoon, all of you who have signed in to watch this webinar. Uh, once again, welcome on behalf of SIDS. Uh, today's speaker, uh, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Rajiv Soman, senior consultant in disease at uh, Jupiter Hospitals, Pune. Uh, like Dr. Nambi said, uh, Dr. Soman is a pioneer of ID in India. Uh, was for a very long time he was at the PD Hinduja Hospitals in Mumbai, where he set up one of the first training programs in ID in the country. Uh, very popular teacher. There are three aspects to his uh, teaching, uh, teaching the principles of ID. Very simple. Number one, his own brand of humor. I'm sure you will hear of it during the presentation. Number one, uh, his uh, philosophical snippets, one-liners. And third is that uh, case-based teaching, the most effective way of conveying a message. So he's uh, probably one of the best teachers I have known. Uh, you'll be hearing it uh, yourself. Over to you, Dr. Soman. Thank you, Osi, for this excellent uh, introduction and also Nambi, and uh, a great opportunity here uh, for me. And uh, one moment, I'll just try and see, yeah. Is my screen seen? My screen is visible? I yes. think so. Yeah. Okay, so this afternoon, friends, we are here to discuss uh, challenges in the diagnosis of uh, this disease. And uh, I acknowledge uh, my uh, microbiology friends, Anjali from Mumbai, as well as Dr. Sampada from Pune who reviewed this uh, presentation. And uh, yeah. So a few disclosures, friends. I am not a microbiologist who would be carrying out tests and report them as positive, negative, hopefully not as indeterminate, discuss the sensitivity specificity, and leave the positive and negative predictive values for us the, for clinical interpretation. Neither am I a radiologist to perform imaging, describe the findings, attribute them to various infectious and even non-infectious entities, and then advise clinical correlation. Finally, I'm not an epidemiologist to make a case definition, which is based on the current scenario, discuss the policy for testing, policy for further action, such as admission, or home uh, isolation, and finally, make a disclaimer that all this does not replace clinical judgment. So the different case types from the official epidemiologic perspective are 
which are always there for, uh, for the last few weeks were imported cases and local transmission cases. However, you might agree with me that an increasingly seen case type now involves patients whose link to foreign travelers or to their di direct contacts can't be ascertained. Maybe we are insufficient in our questioning and so on. Maybe that is possible. But these are likely to be community transmission cases. So if not now, maybe they will come up in a few days' time. For this case type, friends, clinical diagnosis is very difficult. Why? Because there are no pathognomonic features of this disease. And other diagnoses are often really difficult to rule out. You know, we would not be doing multiplex PCR on respiratory samples or upper respiratory samples all the time. It's really difficult to rule out other similar entities. And therefore, no surprise, lab confirmation or lab exclusion assumes the all-important role. But what do we need for that? We need tests to be highly sensitive in order to rule out this infection or specific to rule in the infection. The test should become positive rather early in the disease, should have a short turnaround time, preferably even be point of care, should be inexpensive and should be easily available. Needless to say, friends, that no such test exists. And therefore, the ball is again in, back into the court of the clinician. And so now the clinician has to make a clinical diagnosis. At best, he can have a clinical suspicion. But I will submit to you that even that is not always easy. Now, that suspicion depends on the local stage as well as the rate of COVID-19 versus all other similar illnesses. So this suspicion may be based on fever, dry cough, tiredness, body ache, sore throat, rhinorrhea, diarrhea, sometimes anosmia, agusia, and so on. But remember that there are some cases so, uh, who might be almost asymptomatic. And so not everything that we see is COVID-19. Other causes of similar symptoms includes infections, chiefly viral infections, but even allergies. You know, people would be having upper respiratory symptoms on the basis of allergy. I've seen sometimes clinicians don't want to have anything to do with COVID-19 cases, and they would not really examine the patient, put their minds to it, and they have missed diabetic ketoacidosis because the guy is breathless and also diabetic. And so everyone knows that diabetes can be an important risk factor. So the patient is packed off to have a COVID-19 test and the diabetic ketoacidosis is mixed, missed. Similarly, even acute MI can be missed. On the other hand, almost anything can be COVID-19. As I said, there might be very, very atypical symptoms. These symptoms which I enumerated up are very nonspecific and some of them may not be present at all. What is the importance of all this? Is that these kind of asymptomatic or minimally asymptomatic patients may also sometimes present in the context of other problems, such as acute abdomen and trauma. And I have seen this kind of thing happening. So the patient presents with acute abdomen. He is not really symptomatic for COVID. You can't really think of that. Your whole approach is geared to the abdomen or to the polytrauma which the patient has. Nobody has really asked him whether he has a little bit of cough like uh, or upper respiratory symptoms. So he undergoes the surgery, is in the hospital, and a few days later he develops manifestations of COVID. So really speaking, all these three points are very important for us to remember. On the other hand, let's ask ourselves, why is the diagnosis so very important? We know that this organism and OC told us about it. It's more virulent, it is new, and therefore there is no partial immunity. It tends to produce a cytokine storm later on with a very heightened Th1 response or even something like a mass-like response. And the mortality is at least five times more than that of seasonal flu. And on the other hand, it is more easily transmitted. This R0 definitely depends upon a lot of viral and human factors. And as I am underlining again, that it can also be transmitted from pre-symptomatic individuals and to some extent, even aerosols, to some extent. Uh, this slide, which comes from this oft-quoted uh, paper from Nature, I think is very important to help us understand what time which tests become positive, negative, and what it really means. Okay, so although RT-PCR may remain positive for 28 days from symptom onset, 
there is really not much of virus isolation after about five days for the swab. So the light yellow is the swab or from lower respiratory tract after about eight days and not from the stool after six days. So this is called as a virus isolation. This is not the same as RT-PCR because PCR is going to detect nucleic acid by amplification. After all, it's a NAT. On the other hand, this is a test for viral isolation. And what is this special thing about this roughly eight days? That's the time when many of these patients would have developed antibodies or would have zero converted. We don't know whether they are fully neutralizing, but maybe they are partially neutralizing. And that is the time when the virus load is so much that you know the multiplicity of infection as it is called as. So the virus doesn't find more cells to infect. And that is the time when its virulence reduces and possibly replicative capacity also reduces. So again, what is underlined here that you see that the culture is most often positive in these first few days or maybe a week. So this early phase is actually the most important. And this early phase is liable to be missed because there will be minimum symptoms. But at this same time, there is increased viral shedding in the upper respiratory tract. And this has the potential for what is called as a st stealth transmission. Okay, so without anybody's knowledge, the transmission is going to uh, going on. Uh, screening and triage are very important points. And uh, Ramsuk told us about this, that you need uh, proper IPC measures at the point of entry and so on. You quickly examine the patient, do a quick physical examination, check his oxygen saturation. Technology, we'll talk to that a little later, but it's not always required. But lab tests are certainly required. And then we move on to the all important entity of specimen collection. But before that, a word of this symptom evaluation. So I found this uh, in the literature and I thought it was very important because this tells us which clinical features has a good or adjusted odds ratio. Okay, so being male, having a high temperature, GI symptoms, having some X-ray or CT findings, all that has a high odds ratio of COVID-19. On the other hand, abundant sputum production or polymorph leukocytosis will have a negative odds ratio. Now, the beauty of this schema is that it includes only clinical findings and simple tests. It excludes the exposure criteria, which otherwise depend upon the local epidemiologic context, the phase of the outbreak, and various transmission factors. Other clues, such as lymphocytopenia, a high polymorph to lymphocyte ratio can also be important clues. And what I would think is, maybe we can have a collection of these symptoms and check what are the adjusted odd ratios in our settings. And probably these, this kind of local data can inform the development of a scoring system which might be based on what we see as clinical features and just the simple tests like hemogram and so on, and not really the bigger tests. So the diagnostic evaluation principles are that we want to confirm the diagnosis, but equally importantly, which is very difficult, I, let me put it that way, is to rule, rule it out. Also, we want to assess the stage and the severity of the infection. We want to check for comorbidities because we know those can often determine the ultimate prognosis. And if possible, are there any markers for adverse prognosis? Uh, now this particular slide is almost like the Rubin's timetable for infections post-transplant. I don't see any presentation which does not include this particular slide. It's really a very, very good slide. But I want you to just check on these clinical uh, signs symptoms as well as the what tests you might do in the beginning. So you might want to do to check for lymphopenia, coagulation abnormalities, LDH. Later on as the illness progresses, you want to do radiology, you want to check for SGOT, SGPT, and maybe check whether low procalcitonin is an indirect uh, indicator. And later on when the patient is in the hyperinflammation phase, you are actually looking at various inflammatory markers such as CRP and ferritin and IL-6 and so on. So these might be some of the tests which you would like to do right in the beginning, somewhere in the middle phase and then later on. So the all important thing is the specimen collection. 
Okay, so the nasopharyngeal swab is the recommended way to get the specimen. And uh, that gives us a sensitivity of something like 63%. But what is important is that this should be a deep swab. The swab should be placed there for 10 seconds so as to enable it to absorb the nasopharyngeal secretions. It should be gently twirled three times. Patient often flinches when you put this swab there and it should elicit a tear. That's what it is said. That is probably an adequate swab. If sometimes you might need additional swabs, but this one is the preferred one. So then the next preferred is oropharyngeal swab, and that should elicit a gag. And the sensitivity of that is about 32%, so roughly half of this. And actually, lower respiratory tract samples, if they are really available, probably they yield very good uh, results, but only if they are available. And as I said, abundant sputum production is not a feature of at least not an early feature of this disease. Why not sputum induction? Of course, we want to avoid that because that is an aerosol generating procedure and therefore we don't want to do that sputum induction. Now, in the absence of a good specimen, people are looking at other specimens too. So a deep expectorated sputum or a gargle lavage using 10 ml saline is probably safer, probably is more sensitive and also can be done by the patient themselves without putting the healthcare professionals at risk. Because remember, that is a very important uh, risk which the healthcare worker is subject to. Okay, by the way, this is uh, Nadia, the Bronx Zoo Tiger, who tested positive for COVID-19. I wonder how they obtained the nasopharyngeal swab for this uh, beast without making it flinch and eliciting a tear from the tiger. Okay, I think it's a very tall order. I suspect the person who did it must not have even worn the PPE. Probably he doesn't need it because he'll be eaten even before he could get COVID-19. So what do you do with the swab? You do a RT-PCR and that can be done in the following manner. So you do the first line screening test for one gene and then a confirmatory assay with the other gene and maybe perhaps do a additional confirmatory assay with the third gene. And these are the names of these various genes. So a CT value or a cycle threshold of less than 40 is considered positive. Typically the viral loads are in the range of 10 raised to five per puppies per swap or 10 raised to five per ml in sputum. So roughly just to get us an idea that this is roughly the kind of organism burdens which we see in urinary tract infections or in pneumonias and so on. So that various different genes exist and you are targeting for amplification material from these genes. And uh, the one which we do in India is the E gene, which is the enveloped gene, plus the RNA uh, dependent RNA polymerase. So this is the particular type of test which we do in India. The N gene or the nucleocapsid gene has to components and those two are checked by the CDC and some others are checked in China. Probably the best test to do is this RDRP plus helicase gene where it has the best lower limit of detection and specificity. After all this, all these genes are in the same copy number. So, you know, whether one is better than the other is really dependent upon the type of reagents which are used in the test rather than the copy numbers which are actually the same. The most ideal design would be one where there is a conserved region for the coronaviruses and one specific region. Why do we want to do that? To mitigate against the effects of antigenic drift, which is li liable to happen in future. So with this technology, despite all this technology, we still don't have a very good technology. We are looking for better and better technologies. And one of the good technologies is the LAMP technology. And what do I really mean by that? It's not the previous lamp, but this is, it stands for real-time reverse transcriptase, loop-mediated, isothermal amplification, PCR method. Please don't ask me to say all this again. Suffice it to say that it's a lamp technology. Okay, so this has an excellent advantage of one copy, lower limit of detection versus 100 for RT-PCR. The test time is also much less, like 20 minutes versus two to six hours for the RT-PCR. With all the steps, if you take together, it is going to be six hours. 
And interestingly, 288 tests can be done in an hour's time, whereas for the NAT or the usual RT-PCR, it's only one test at a time. The next important uh, leap in technology, perhaps, is self-enclosed systems. So we are all familiar with this cartridge-based systems. So there, what is done is the whole system is integrated together. So the nucleic acid amplification Ex sorry, extraction, amplification, and detection. All that is done after it is, the cartridge is shut. Okay, so it becomes very easy for the operator. So this CEFID test, which is called as the Expert Express SARS-CoV-2 test, that uses the current design principles in which multiple regions of the viral genome are probed. We are very familiar with these probes which we use for MTB detection and maybe RPO mutations detection. So similar probes are there, which help us to detect the virus. And it provides results in approximately 45 minutes with less than a minute of hands-on time to prepare the sample. And uh, close on its heels is the biofire test. And that runs on fully automated film array two or film array torch platforms. And we are familiar with some of these platforms also. Again, requires very minimal training, delivers results in approximately 45 minutes. So these are real advances in uh, NAC technology, which might be very useful in a country like ours, where all this kind of automation is required. Doing RT-PCR is definitely technologically very, very demanding. Now, what about the things which we talked about, like the viral cultures? I mean, it would be really ideal if you could do that, but obviously that is not at all possible. It's possible in research labs and ongoing deep sequencing methods because we also want to know whether the virus is mutating in future. And But all these tests are only meant for research purposes. They are certainly beyond the, my scope, beyond the scope of this talk also. When we talk about the sensitivity and uh, other attributes of this RT-PCR test, COVID-19 actually highlights the difference between what we call as analytical and clinical sensitivity. Try and understand the difference between the two. Analytical sensitivity is the ability of the test to detect the pathogen in the specimen. Okay, so this is the submitted specimen. Is there the pathogen in that? That is the question. On the other end, clinical sensitivity is the ability of the test to detect the infected status of the patient. Okay, so if the specimen is corrected, collected at the wrong time, in not in the proper method, and so on, then the clinical sensitivity of the test, so it's, you can't blame the test for it, okay, because the sample itself was not adequate, what can the poor test do? So this depends upon the sampling side, the method of collection, the duration of symptoms, because as we said, viral loads are much, much higher right in the beginning, and they start going down maybe after seven, eight days disease severity, which probably also determine the organism burden. And then repeat testing may be needed because the single test, because the single negative test may wrongly inform us. It will wrongly inform decisions about admission, follow-up, quarantine, especially if you are doing this test for a healthcare professional because you want him to be quarantined and not to go on infecting his uh, patients. So this kind of repeat testing may be needed. I'll just give you an example. It is like you are doing several blood cultures, several sets of blood cultures, because the sensitivity of this test is not so good. So the sensitivity starts going up if you do the test multiple times or you have multiple swaps. That's the exact same meaning like you have uh, for blood cultures. So when you have all these problems, can there be an alternative to look at? And what that alternative can be serology. Can serology help some of these decisions? Because this decision becomes extremely important. If you have a negative NAC test, are you going to let the patient off or no? That is the question. And let's see if serology helps. So in serology, broadly, you have method of antigen detection and method of antibody detection. So the methods of antigen detection are being developed. But really, at this moment, they have poor sensitivity due to the low burden of the virus and sampling variability. On the other hand, you can detect antibodies by the usual three methods. So it's chemiluminescence, ELISA, and lateral flow technique. All these measure the host response to infection and are already available internationally. We are still not, uh, you know, we don't have it in India yet, although in uh, 
I'll come to that a little later, but for the usual clinical purpose, we don't have it yet. So how does this test perform as regards vis-a-vis uh, -vis other tests, such as, now this is a nice uh, uh, article in uh, CID March 28th. Okay, and this tells you in one go, what are the time of the, the test become positive. So look, if you look at the days since onset, the RNA is positive. Uh, I can't show you here, this last part of the slide actually tells you what is the positivity. So if you have this color, it is roughly 70%. If you have this color, it is roughly about 90 to 100%. Okay, so you have about 70% at best uh, sensitivity here, and it peters down as you go down further. So rarely you might get the RT-PCR positive right at 28 days, but very, very occasional. On the other hand, if you look at this total antibody, it's negative in the beginning, but it comes up around this time. So by the day, you know, it starts becoming positive somewhere here, but by day 15, it is really almost 100% positive. If you look at IgM, again, it comes up a little earlier. On the other end, IgG would be coming up as expected. And probably IgA, which we don't uh, measure, but is measured in the total antibody here. And therefore, it's IgM, IgA, which would be giving you positivity right in the beginning. But there are issues with this. IgM is notoriously non-specific, and that we know in the context of leptospira, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and so many other infections. On the other hand, IgG needs weeks for it to become positive. And therefore, no, not at all a no-brainer that it is less likely to have a role in active disease management because you want this here. You know, there's nothing which is coming positive right in the beginning because that's the time when you are going to triage the patient, you are going to assign one or the other uh, sites of for treatment and so on. So that is the time when it is not really coming to a help. But its real help is when you want to assess the burden of infection in the community as a whole, what might be the role of asymptomatic infection, if any. It can help us to calculate the basic are not value, mainly for epidemiological purpose. And also, if you want to calculate the overall mortality at the end of the epidemic or towards the later phases of the epidemic, yes, this will tell us how many people were actually infected with this virus. I'll summarize for you the differences between the RT-PCR and the antibodies one more time, because I think this is the important part of my talk. So the sample for the PCR is nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal or perhaps a gargle. So antibody, it is much simpler because you just need a blood sample. The sampling is hazardous, technical and transport issues because this needs the viral transport medium, needs to go very quickly to the lab, which is testing it and, and uh, on dry ice and uh, so on. What about sensitivity? At best, 70% and definitely goes down later on, whereas, this can be as good as 95% after day five. This is another uh, publication which talked about 95% after five days, but certainly 95 to 100% after day 10, 15. What's the use of this NAT test in a patient with symptoms? It is useful to confirm the diagnosis rather than to exclude and give an all clear signal. I cannot emphasize this point more. This is extremely important to understand that in a patient with symptoms, it will confirm, but it cannot rule out. A negative test cannot rule out. I mean, because we just have this test and nothing else, we are using it to allow patients to go home and so on. But still, we all don't tell them not to follow any precautions. Because we are not very sure, even when the test comes negative, that it is truly negative. And therefore, they probably need home isolation or home quarantine. But I think the appropriate word is quarantine at that stage. Um, what about the use of the antibody in a patient with symptoms and negative PCR? If you have a positive antibody, now why would you get a negative PCR? Because either the test sensitivity is poor or you have done it a little later on. But at that stage, the antibody is likely to be positive. So if you, in this situation, if you find a positive antibody, it adds to the confidence in our diagnosis. Obviously, this is more expensive, has a higher, uh, longer uh, turnaround time. It can help you to diagnose a current illness, whereas uh, this can be mainly used for epidemiological purpose, for zero epidemiology and so on. And this double sandwich method of this antibody is actually specific for SARS-CoV-2. 
immediately know whether this is an antibody to the some previous coronavirus infection or something like that. It's not a case. It is specific for this particular virus. So this is the proposed uh, treatment, uh, sorry, investigation strategy by the ICMR, which is appearing very, very reasonable. And this is as recent as fourth appear. Okay, so you would use this antibody in a cluster zone or a containment zone or where there have been large migration gatherings or evacuates. So it's really meant for you and me as a clinician. Okay, so we don't have access to this antibody test right now. Okay, and so you might perform that test and if it comes positive, you call it as a probable COVID. If it's negative, and if you still have a strong suspicion, do a NAT test or a RT-PCR, and then uh, go according to the result. And if it is negative, and still the RT-PCR comes negative, or you repeat the antibody test after 10 days, so by then, you know, you cannot say that the antibody test was done too fast, too soon. So the 10-day test is bound to be positive if it is actually a infection. Let's turn our attention, friends, uh, now to what the virus is doing inside the lungs. Okay, so we have to talk about radiology. I'm not a microbiologist, so I'm a physician, so I need to know a little bit about radiology as well. So CT scan is an extraordinarily good tool to find out what is happening in the lungs. Okay, so what are the clinical radiological features or the CT features? So you have bilateral, basal, and sub abnormalities and they are mainly in the form of ground glass opacity so ground glass is something which is you know diff mildly uh, opaque but it, what it shows is that the lung vascular markings and the bronchovascular markings are still seen to that so that's the definition of a ground glass opacity additionally there are interlobular septal thickening and intralobular septal thickening uh, you know this my image is coming in the way but a little bit of that is seen here so that kind of uh, septal thickening, intra, inter, and intralobular septal thickening gives you a crazy living pattern. You can also get a reverse halo sign, which is depicted here. It's again obscured by the SIDS logo. Uh, but the reverse halo sign is somewhat like the SIDS logo too. Fibrous septa, traction, bronchiectasis, these are features which come up much later. So what is important to us is what is not COVID. Okay, so what do you don't expect to see in COVID? is lobar consolidation, cavitation, tree in bud, nodules, global and pericardial effusion. So if you see these things, it is less, less, very, very less likely to be COVID-19. The next imaging modality, which seems to be very attractive, is lung ultrasound. Okay, so if you do a lung ultrasound with that spatial transducer, in this area, for example, which is showing you ground glass opacity, you will see a distorted, Plural lining there, maybe subplural, small consolidations or small collections of fluids. Remember, this is subplural, which is not a plural effusion at all. And then below that, now these small collections allow the ultrasound to penetrate further. And then into the lung, you see what are called as these B lines. Okay, so they are looking like uh, and so on, they are moving. And so on. On the other hand, if you do it in a very large area of this kind of a ground glass appearance, you see confluent lines. So when all of them become confluent, you see this thing which is sometimes called as a waterfall sign. Okay, so you have irregular thick plural lines. As I said, subplural fluid consolidation allows ultrasound to penetrate. And then you get this flashlight like B lines, which are confluent, thick, irregular. And when they become fixed, it's called as a waterfall sign. And in the end, you might actually get consolidation. So that is consolidation like our usual pneumonia. And then you're going to see air bronchogram. And interestingly, if you can do a Doppler over there, you will find that there is impaired blood flow in that region, in the lesion. And more and more people are now convinced that there is something going wrong with the coagulation and the circulation in the lung, which is also a pathognomonic sign for COVID-19. Now, what is the great plus point of ultrasound versus CT. It's useful because the, all this is subplural disease. You know, if it were very deep in the parahylar region, ultrasound would not be very useful. It can help us for triage. It can help us to even eliminate the stethoscope. It's sort of point of care because even the ICU resident can do this and relay the images to the radiologist who need not even enter the ICU. It has repeatability. It can track the disease evolution. 
it can check response to maneuvers. So if you do prone positioning or lateral positioning and you find that good things are happening on the ultrasound, it can be useful. Low cost, no radiation. CT, you'll reserve it if USG is actually insufficient to provide answers. And obviously you know that seriously ill patients have great difficulty moving to the CT suite. There's bound to be some nosocomial exposure. There might be a requirement for deep cleaning of the CT suite after the CT is done. So probably ultrasound will take um, a precedence. I'd like to finish off with some uncertainties. Are antibodies to this disease neutralizing? See, there are antibodies against the S protein and antibodies against N protein. So S protein is responsible for transmission, receptor binding, and fusion. And the N protein is responsible for replication RNA packaging. Most of the time, antibodies which have been detected so far are to the N protein and not to the S protein. Needless to say, therefore, that the antibodies are going to be partially protective or partially neutralizing. If perhaps you had antibodies to both, maybe you will have neutralizing antibodies. Let's see what a vaccine is able to do. Now, how is cure and non-infectivity asserted? Again, very difficult. Resolution of symptoms and signs, of course, and two consecutive negative RT-PCRs from respiratory samples. Some people have even talked about rectal swabs, which might be useful to ascertain negativity. However, the question remains, does a positive RT-PCR represent replication competent virus? After all, it, we are more interested in whether that whatever is detected represents replication competent virus, which is going to transmit disease to others. Otherwise, it's of uh, precious little consequence. And if that is so, if the positive RT-PCR does not represent replication competent virus, is the home isolation, which is advised for further 14 days, is it really an overkill? So these are, there are, I know, hundreds of other controls and I'm sure you So to summarize and conclude, symptoms can be minimal and non-specific. Okay, so the physician cannot easily make a diagnosis. CBC abnormalities are there, but again, they are non-specific. Radiology, especially CT, as I, we discussed, has lots of issues of logistics, disease transmission, etc. Lab diagnosis has an all-important role. But remember that RT-PCR has suboptimal sensitivity, long tat, it's expensive, not freely available. And therefore, in future, what might be even more important are these integrated cartridge-based systems. They may become the key. Serology, not yet available to us clinicians here. And the serology, as I said, is tardy. It is going to become positive only after maybe 10 days. And so diagnostics, we are going to keep relying on these diagnostics and they have to keep pace with this epidemic as it rapidly transitions from one level to the next. And that's how rapidly it is transitioning. And with this, I'll stop here and um, I hope I can answer some of your questions. I turn over to the moderator, Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. Thank you. Of the currently available technologies, their strengths and drawbacks, and uh, very practical suggestions how to incorporate into your day-to-day -day practice. So now, uh, coming to questions, uh, Rajiv, the first one is about uh, CT scan. Can you differentiate between ILD and COVID-19 on the CT scan? Um, to some extent, yes, because, uh, you know, the, this uh, crazy payment, uh, crazy paving and uh, ground glass, it, it is also, I mean, many common features are there, but to some extent, yes. So we'll uh, again have to just ask the history, whether the patient has a long, long history of uh, IRD or a very short history. I think the history, if the CT is not able to differentiate, the history can certainly uh, very, very easily discriminate. Next question is about lockdown, not relevant to this uh, presentation. Uh, is it possible to get cavitary lesions in COVID-19? Uh, whatever I, I mean, I have no personal experience of having, uh, looking at uh, CT scans in a large number of patients and so on. But what the literature says is cavitation would be very unusual to see in this uh, disease. Cavitation generally indicates a lot of necrosis which occurs in a you know, after all this cavitation is because of metalloproteases and various other destructive enzymes which are produced. To what extent they are produced in uh, COVID, I don't know. And it is more of a general disease rather than a localized disease. So cavitation, lung abscess, I don't think would be important features. 
if 5GF, if both are possible, when RT-PCR is negative, should the patient be treated? In any case, we don't know what how to treat the patient, okay? So that solves the problem. Yes, the patient should, may not be, uh, I mean, what, what is the point in treating the patient if he is already asymptomatic at that stage? You know, generally by the day 14, 10, 12, either he's become much better or otherwise he is in the ICU seriously ill and maybe at that stage antiviral drugs themselves are not going to be that useful. It's, you know, treatment will have to be geared towards the inflammatory state. Next is on uh, uh, what precautions to take during processing of Serum samples for antibody testing. Is centrifuging blood samples in bacteria going to generate aerosols? Uh, maybe I'm not the right person to answer this question, but I suppose no, because viremia is hardly there in the blood sample. And uh, so when they are just going to deal with uh, blood samples, uh, I don't think so. But uh, maybe you'll have to talk to the microbiologist. I'm not sure. But like you said, there's no viremia. <laughs> yeah. What right. PP to wear while handling clinical samples, requisition forms, and registers? PP to wear during clinical samples, requisition forms, and registers. Personal protection equipment. No, I don't think you need that. I mean, if everything has been taken care of, sealed properly, put in a nice box, and so on, which you are not going to drop on the way somewhere, and so on, then I don't think you really need a personal protective equipment measures during that time. They just give it and deliver it safely to the laboratory. After that, they'll take care. Is anti-RBD spike antibody title level measurement useful? Is it protective? Is it RPRB? I don't know what it is. Must be, RPRB. must be. Yeah, I have no idea what's uh, maybe the speak the question, uh, the person asking the question, I'm sure must be knowing the answer, but you have stumped me there. I don't know. I, I'm also not sure about the answer. Uh, Nambi, any idea? No, no, I have no ideas. Does the persistent viral shedding translate to infectivity in COVID-19? When can a patient be discharged with relation to the viral count? You address that, but you want to repeat that, Rajiv? Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it once more. I was anticipating that this is going to be a vexing question. Uh, and that's why I put that slide to tell us a little bit about when does the replication competent or the infective virus disappear? It appears that it will disappear in a moderate illness after about eight days or 10 days. So after that, possibly the patient is not infected. The current opinion overwhelmingly is to wait for signs and symptoms to go away, wait for two RT-PCRs done 24 hours apart to be negative, and even after that, you will tell, still tell them to home isolate that person for another 14 days. Now, is all this an overkill? Maybe it is, but until we know a lot more about it, I suppose it's safe to carry out the same thing which has been advised by everyone. Sir, after the first, how often do we open this patient? Sorry, how often? How often do you keep on testing the patient? if the first test is negative. Okay, so the, again, I showed you that chart which has been put out by ICMR and that says that if the suspicion is strong, then we should repeat it again. But here I, have to make, I would like to make a point. You know, if your first test was negative, when the viral burden should have been higher, huh, then it is not very reasonable to think that the next tests are going to be positive. But of course, that's the only way you can do because you want to do more number of tests so that we hope that at least one of them is positive. But please remember that RT-PCR positivity keeps declining as time passes. So the second test, third test, if you keep doing with the hope that it will be positive, I think it is going to be difficult. Uh, sir, can HR is a screening tool in hospitalized patients while we await PCR reports? Again, the problem is this, that yes, it, uh, you know, there are these two things which are very important. So checking the patient's saturation, even if the patient is not breathless, is probably very important. I have seen a few patients where the, even the x-ray is quite good because you can see that peripheral, you know, bi bilateral lower zone ground glassing, which is quite, you hardly ever see that in other diseases. And the same thing you're going to see with the CT scan. 
so if your chest uh, x ray is also okay means not you are not able to see that ct scan will be a far far more sensitive test but let me tell you one thing that you are sending that patient to the ct suite you are ex exposing a large number of people if he, indeed he has an infection then all of them will have to take lot of precautions maybe you will have to do a deep cleaning of the ct scan machine after that which i have told can take anywhere between um, one or two hours okay so that might be a problem if you keep sending such patients uh, frequently what's your opinion about this by cmc velour by dr sheshadri sorry about yes clinical scoring system oh, I, i am not aware about it uh, if so i can if you know you tell uh, it's a score based on symptoms and epidemiological link uh, it has not been validated prospectively but if you are in the middle of a pandemic with ongoing community transmission every patient who fulfills a certain criteria is likely to be covid just like influenza like illness in the middle of influenza pandemic is most likely to be influenza similar to that right right so validate the prospectively though i think icmr yeah. is planning to do that okay see i have to show you those uh, that other one which is uh, uh, you know which is doesn't bring into play the epidemiological link you know it's only on the basis of the clinical features and very simple tests such as cbc or maybe an x ray and uh, it's not uh, requiring that particular epidemiology that two types of things either your own travel or you are exposed to somebody who's traveled or you are exposed to somebody who's got actually covid-19 so if these three things are not there then it becomes rather difficult no epidemiological because if that scoring system is based on the epidemiological link then i am sure the weight assigned to that will be far far more than all others is that am i right in that yeah yeah it is <laughs> If ongoing community transmission that uh, epidemiological link is meaningless in goes yes next question a patient who is symptom positive what are the sequence of testing that he will be subjected to sequence of testing in a symptomatic patient right so you, you depending on the time like we don't have antibodies so i cannot comment on uh, the use of antibodies at that stage but in case the patient has come you know in the first week or whatever whenever he comes to you even if it is late but if he is he has come to you then then the first preferred test would be the nasopharyngeal swab uh, maybe you know this gargling and other alternative methods of uh, collection might be better if you see that diagram the lower respiratory tract contains more virus a little later on in the illness and so if gargling is able to pick up that maybe that is a good test but right now we are stuck with the nasopharyngeal swab Uh, since we don't have the antibody test for our uh, use for the usual clinicians i can't comment on that but otherwise if the patient is coming a little later then maybe the antibody is the first thing to do in order to make a retrospective diagnosis of covid 19 okay so somebody who's come <coughs> with a say <coughs> 10 day history 12 day history of of all this he is now improving you want to know now whether this was indeed covid 19 to an antibody test if that is positive it's fine if it is negative it is very very unlikely that that illness could have been due to covid 19 because the sensitivity is so high at the end of say 15 days if the screening as a but confirmatory s and rd rpg negative how to report and manage these cases should the test be done with a repeat sample when inconclusive that's right so you know there are ways of calling it as indeterminate also and then then you need to repeat the test again so you need the confirmatory gene and so the, the practice in india is that e uh, e gene followed by the uh, polymerase gene so these two have to be done and if they are positive we call it as confirmatory if it is not then repeat the sample again all this is very easy to say repeat the sample you know to take a sample again to say, you know uh, make the patient pay again send all this it's not very easy in practice is cross reactivity with other human beta coronavirus is possible no it's not possible at least on with whatever i have read it's not possible so uh, the nucleic acid is also specific as well as the antibody you know it has uh, what is called as double sandwich elisa method 
so other sars cov1 is also not uh, there other leave alone other uh, endemic uh, uh, seasonal coronaviruses no so there is no cross reactivity how to detect asymptomatic cases how to detect asymptomatic cases yes oh, i wish i knew i wish i knew that okay so what you can again do is the same use the same great test that is the rt pcr with the sensitivity of 70% and then if it is positive you say yes you are asymptomatically infected but if if it comes no you cannot say i can tell you anything about it can can we check test like cdc esr stool in the asymptomatic person stool for rt pcr in the asymptomatic person uh, that has not been mentioned what i think what he means is uh, will uh, complete blood count and esr give a clue as i said it will give you a clue that you know you are getting low lymphocytes you are going to get a polymorph to lymphocyte ratio which is increased means on the one hand it is slightly increased polymorphs but markedly lower lymphocytes so these are very very indirect clues i don't think you can big, uh, build a big story on the basis of this cbc abnormalities what has really been described is very very low lymphocyte counts late in the disease so it's a marker of disease severity okay but not really a marker of diagnosis so it becomes uh, rather difficult to base anything on mild uh, cbc abnormality sometimes we do see very striking uh, lymphocyte count low but there could be other reasons for that doing stool rt pcr i am not aware of any uh, such uh, study but where i read is it could be one of the tests which are which could be done perhaps uh, before you release the patient okay but uh, i have no personal experience and nothing more than what i read in a couple of places are there any antigen tests for covid 19 antibody tests are not not, not available they are rudimentary they are uh, being developed but as i said there are lots of difficulties with that you, uh, you know the amount of antigen in the blood is not not that adequate like i said there isn't much of viremia so the antigen itself is not likely to be in good measure for us to check it next two questions are on analytical sensitivity and clinical sensitivity can you please explain that analytical more, okay sensitivity. analytical sensitivity you see this is not just true for covid 19 it's true for any any test analytical sensitivity refers to i have a sample i have, my point is to can i detect the pathogen in that sample if i can do that that is the analytical sensitivity on the other hand clinical sensitivity refers to whether i can detect the infected state or status of the patient in front of me okay so that means this sample so i take one sample which is having the pathogen the other sample i am taken wrongly you know either i haven't done that properly or i have taken it when the disease is on a decline and so on so so then that sample is not likely to contain the organism okay and so that is then the test will come negative so in that time you can't say that the test has missed this because it did not contain that sample uh, the pathogen in that particular sample so whether the sample contains the pathogen or whether there is a infected status of the patient these are the two things you know so clinical sensitivity depends upon how the sample is collected how it is shipped to the lab uh, whether it's collected on time whether and all the other issues with it so in a so that's the basic difference so i it is just meant to highlight that all these issues of sample collection transport processing are extremely important in this disease it might not be so important in others because you know the patient is there there are so many samples available you are having uh, your own lab is doing it and here you find that all these issues are there about transport and going to some other lab and so on so it's going to be the, that's why it, this has brought into focus the real difference between analytical and clinical sensitivity in the chart of tagline of this what day is day zero date of infection or date of onset of symptoms in the chart of the time uh, time you showed the timeline when the yeah, different yeah. it's <laughs> always symptoms because no one knows what is the date of inf uh, actual infection you know the incubation period we take it that 
roughly it is you know it can be up to 14 days but usually 2 to 5 or 2 to 7 days would be the time but for the chart it is from the day of symptoms what is the role of covid 19 detection sputum in covid 19 detection sputum yes sputum sputum yeah so if a good quality sputum, see again this is uh, uh, what i have read it is not yet completely validated it is likely that sputum a good sputum sample okay an expectorated sample please not a nebulized sample can be a very good sample okay so because basically we know that uh, a little later in the day that means after a few days the lower respiratory contains more virus than the nasal or nasopharyngeal so it is likely that the sputum sample might be giving a better yield and here don't remember remember that we are not concerned with contamination okay we are doing a specific nucleic acid amplification test let there be any amount of uh, contaminating bacteria anaerobes and whatever you have in anywhere or in this part that's never going to be a problem so the usual considerations for bacterial are that you don't want any contamination from the upper respiratory or you want a good lower respiratory sample no saliva no nothing all this may not be very important here so even a good gargle sample they have looked at is found, found to be quite high uh, in its yield for this particular nat what is the evidence for the immune response is associated with partial or complete immunity evidence because the number of cases who have got uh, let me put it the other way around a small number of people who have got a second infection is a uh, evidence against complete immunity okay so so by corollary i can say that that means there must be partial immunity i am not aware of any studies where they have actually put antibodies and tried to neutralize uh, the pathogenicity in vitro of the virus and so on you know there are those kind of uh, plaque neutralization assays and so on but i am not aware about these kind of studies done for covid 19 sir is it possible to use antibody for treating others Oh, I am unable to catch the whole sentence properly. Sir, is it possible to use recover patients' antibody for treating others? Yeah, there is a huge research effort on this. You know, the everyone is wanting. To, in fact, they have already used it, and uh, they are trying to have a control trial on that to see whether convalescent plasma is going to be helpful. Um, if all that we are talking just now is correct and there are neutralizing or at least partially neutralizing antibodies then uh, definitely it should succeed the optimal way how much to give who's to give and uh, when is it safe to give from that or collect from that patient these are all still important unanswered questions what is the incident false positive rt pcr in such a case absence of antibody at the end of 10 days confirm this yeah see by and large false positive rt pcr would be very very unusual i think it will be you know if there is a mislabeling of the sample in the laboratory or some such uh, you know issue uh, it's not so important for a clinician to bother with okay so I, i don't know what is the it is a very small figure and should not be a major problem it's the other way around which is the most important problem. what about reverse halo sign halo sign is it characteristic of covid 19 no 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 not at all it is described as one of the signs our classic all i mean all id physicians know that the the main uh, disease to think of in a reverse halo sign is mucormycosis of the lung but of course you can get it in almost anything including staphylococcal pseudomonal klebsiella pneumonia nocardia everything so it's not pathognomonic so again all radiology has to be interpreted in the light and it's not wrong at all when the radiologist says that i am seeing this 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 now go and interpret it clinically okay so if the patient has a history suggestive of covid 19 then this rhc or the reverse yellow sign is yes it's a good sign for this that's all what about myocarditis <laughs> yeah myocarditis uh, the enzymes are high qt can also be a problem arrhythmias is a problem and in fact that is one of the reasons why all these drugs which are going to produce um, so we certainly know that they are going to produce problems with qt and myocardium 
we don't know whether for certain they are going to have efficacy so that is the main thing so the myocarditis is certainly one of the important issues what should not be there is a pericardial effusion uh, is a negative test after improvement required as it is likely to be positive for a long time yeah but that's what uh, has been recommended I, as i told you in this controversy we do not really know what is the end point for the patient to to be good to go we don't know that that's why this is used as a as something to cover our uh, ignorance maybe that we will insist on two tests which are negative again we have the first test you know because the test sensitivity is poor so you want two tests and then after that also you are keeping him isolated for 14 days so with all this you know multiple layers of protection i suppose you done the right thing any word on viremia <laughs> as far as i know viremia i mean usually viremia is there in almost all infections but it might be very transient it might be low grade it is not like hiv where it's the blood which is uh, very rich in virus so nothing much to talk about and uh, complain about it uh, rapid testing kit how effective is it how does it work and is it available in india that is the antibody test rapid antibody test yeah yeah it, see it is not as good as the elisa that's what i am told and uh, it must be available but it's not available to clinicians it is available for the testing as indicated by the icm so if you are dealing with that kind of a situation of clusters and exposures to gatherings and so on maybe that that is there but it is not as good as elisa since we are almost at the end of the last two questions should i refer every patient the flu like illness for covid-19 testing uh, i think uh, it's a very difficult question to uh, it depends on what kind of uh, practice you have uh, if you are dealing with uh, patients who don't mind first of all even if you refer they may not do it unless the suspicion is strong maybe when they liberalize the criteria for uh, doing the test which includes only the ability to pay then maybe you can send all patients to do that otherwise you apply your uh, usual triage characteristics think of what is the likelihood of it being positive negative and then uh, do it see often after doing the test we must also know what to do with it you know even if i get it positive or what uh, am i going to do anything di far differently Th that is the question do i have a sort of a ramban uh, remedy for it i don't even have it okay so by knowing that in a patient who has got minimum symptoms in any case the treatment even if it comes positive you are not going to admit him you are going to do home isolation which you can you can do even without the test so you will have to use clinical judgment and uh, so on and how easy it is, easy it is to do the test how easy it is on the pocket of the patient all these things will come in so the last question if the lamp has said why are we doing rt pcr now again i have no idea i have i just uh, tamila told me about this lamp assay so i put it in my uh, slide so maybe you can uh, i'll give you her email and you can ask her this uh, is it available i think the vendor is already pushing for it but uh, probably we will need uh, you know go ahead signals from icmr or other uh, agencies to validate it and then maybe you can use it it looks very very attractive to me there are many more questions uh, we are out of our time thank you very much rajiv that was a very interesting very uh, comprehensive presentation and you patiently answered all the relevant questions thank you very much rajiv and back thank to you Dr. for winding up the session uh, uh, thank you dr rajiv soman a fantastic lucid lecture as usual and uh, i think it was done very well uh, but i just want to make only one comment uh, probably a couple of comments this uh, two negative pcrs to probably clear a patient this is something that is new to us we have never done with any other respiratory viruses let it be influenza h1n1 and I, i i personally believe that it really complicates the whole process one thing is the testing 
you may not be doing tests for patients who need it. Other one is uh, the beds are being occupied for negative PCRs, even though the patients have uh, clinically been cleared. So you know, probably we may have to have some kind of uh, evolving discussion in that area. Probably started with China and every single country has followed it with this two negative PCRs. Uh, another comment is, I personally believe that no test is good enough to rule out COVID. All these yes. tests have value when they are positive. When they are negative, doesn't mean anything. So the diagnosis of COVID uh, has to be based on history, clinical examination, basic labs, radiology, plus the serology or the PCR. But the most important thing is a sound mind of a treating physician. I think that is the most important thing that we cannot simplify it by doing a test and then ruling in, ruling out. It's going to be very, very difficult. That's my personal opinion on the diagnosis of COVID. And it's been a four lecture series, it's been completed. We have two more uh, lectures to come up. And tomorrow the lecture will be by Dr. Subra, Subramanian Swaminathan on uh, infection control in special situations. A lot of questions on uh, operation theaters being asked. And I hope that would be a very interesting lecture. And uh, this lecture series would be available in our uh, website, uh, sidsindia.org, as well as it is also available in the YouTube channel where you have to just uh, type SIDS webinars. And once again, thanks Dr. OC for being the moderator and for a very fantastic lucid lecture as usual in that Aramse mode by Dr. Rajiv Suman. Thank you. And thanks friends for joining and uh, meet you again tomorrow. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good lecture, sir. Very good lecture.